Today, we begin a summer series on the parables of Jesus, and I have chosen a parable that's known as the sheep and the goats. I was in high school in grade 11 when I really noticed this, that parable of the sheep and the goats. And it really came to my attention when I heard a song by a man named Keith Green. Keith Green was a 20-something-year-old musician in the 1970s who was part hippie, part prophet, part mystic, part songwriter, part social activist. And he suddenly appeared on the Christian music scene with songs that were so honest and so blunt that teenagers just loved his music. It's the fact that he was 20-something years old writing these raw, honest Christian songs was really, I think, a move of God. He began re releasing solo albums in 1977, which, you know, I realized, you know, if, if I had been hearing someone preach this song uh, when I was a teenager, if I was a teenager in the room uh, back you know, when I was a teenager in those days, they'd be talking about the 1930s. You know, that's how long ago 1977 is from today. It would have been like saying to me in my, when I was 17, back in 1935, well, that's a long time ago, but his music is still extremely relevant. He was so popular that it was only six years after he began releasing music that he had a greatest hits album because his, his songs were so popular. And that, that album came out between my grade 11 and my grade 12 years. So I was in the middle of high school, the summer after grade 11, when he came out with what was called the Keith Green Collection. And it contained songs that had already really pierced my heart. And there were songs like, How Can They Live Without Jesus? A song called Asleep in the Light. These were songs that pierced me. I felt convicted by the words, not just entertained by the music. But the Keith Green Collection also contained a live version of a paraphrase of the whole parable of the sheep and the goats. It was an eight-minute song where he just played the piano and paraphrased by speaking the song rather than singing the song. He spoke the parable with a piano background. I was mesmerized by it. Especially when he got to the end of the parable and he added a line that wasn't included in Scripture. And, well, let's, let's, it, and that line that he ended with shocked me as a teenager. I, I just remember, what? I, I've never heard that before. And it really got my attention. So let me read the parable, and then I'll read you what he said at the end of the parable when he played the song, played music as he read the song. I'm going to read Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then Keith Green's piano music changed key to, to a minor key. A sort of a foreboding key. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. 
I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, <laughs> when? When, when, did we, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or, or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And then, at the end of Keith Green's live performance, playing piano in the background, as his piano music continued, he boldly stated, And my friends, the only difference between the sheep and the goats, according to the scripture, is what they did and didn't do. And that's exactly how he said it with this amazing piano flourish at the end. It rocked my teenage world. It was like I'd never heard such things before. Keith Green was challenging all of us easily distracted Christian teenagers to live what we learn. And as we learned Jesus' words, and as a teenager who'd only just really begun living for Jesus, I really wanted to embrace this rebuke. I really wanted to receive it. It felt like a loving rebuke to a loveless church in a world filled with need, and I needed to wake up to that need. It also sounded like Jesus was saying that my eternal destiny depended on it. But Jesus never ever said that we needed to earn salvation from him. Jesus never, Jesus never said that. Jesus came to say actually the opposite. He, he came to say there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. Because Jesus did all that was needed for us to be forgiven by God and to spend eternity with him. So as inspiring as Keith Green's song was, his blunt and challenging flourish was rather unhelpful. So what are we left with if Keith Green's message at the end of his parable is not the message of the parable? We're left with a valuable clue regarding a family trait of those who Jesus has saved and welcomed into his kingdom. And that's why I've given this sermon a rather unexpected title. Rather than calling this parable the sheep and the goats, I'm going to call this parable a king who wants a family. My first point is a king who invites us in. Nowhere in this parable does Jesus explicitly say that he is the son of man that he refers to in this parable. But it's important for us to remember that everything Jesus said from Matthew chapter 24 verse 4 to the end of this parable at Matthew 25 46 is is his answer to his disciples question. In Matthew 24, verse 3, his disciples had asked him, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? They were asking him that question. And that means that all three parables in Matthew 25 have to do with answering that question about the sign of Jesus' coming. Which means it would make sense that Jesus is talking about himself in this parable. Because he's talking about the signs of his coming. As Jesus described himself, he described himself as the son of man in chapter 25, verse 31, and as the king in verse 34 of the same chapter. The term son of man was Jesus' favorite term to refer to himself as. He used that term more than any other term, son of man. And it's actually an extremely significant term. Jesus got that term, son of man, from an ancient passage written by a prophet by the name of Daniel. Daniel wrote this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. 
that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That's, that sounds like the king who's gathered all the nations to himself in this parable, doesn't it? Because it speaks of him being given all the nations, all the peoples and languages of the world. So this king is not a king to be trifled with. He's powerful. He has all authority. He has great authority and he can dispense eternal life and eternal punishment. This week, when I was preparing the sermon, I asked someone, what's the first thing that Jesus quoted himself saying in this parable? They didn't have their Bible open, and their answer was, depart from me. <laughs> that was what they thought the first thing Jesus said was. Well, that's because when people, whenever people think of this parable, the sheep and the goats, they think of it as a big, heavy judgment, harsh and heavy so that was the first thing they thought Jesus said was depart from me. But actually, the first thing Jesus says in this parable is the word come. Come. It's an invitation. After reading this parable many times, as well as listening to Keith Green's musical version, my focus has typically been on Jesus saying, for I was this or that, and then you did or didn't do this or that. And so my, my focus isn't on the fact that he, he said come instead of depart from me. That's how he began by, say, by, by inviting us to come to him. My focus is on myself. My focus is on how well I'm doing at being the you that he refers to in this parable. You. What are you doing? And so I... Analyze myself. I look in the mirror. I check myself. Am I living up to this parable? Am I, am I doing this or that on which my eternal destiny seems to depend? Sounds pretty important. But the problem is, as much as I focus on that, I never measure up. And I never will. And if that's the case, does the word Come, that precious invitation to come even apply to me? Is he inviting me to come? It's easy to see how this is a very unhelpful way to examine this parable. What if I were to tell you, this is a little bit of a risky thing to say, what if I were to tell you that God doesn't want you focused on yourselves when you read this parable? What if he doesn't want us focusing on ourselves as we hear it? Jesus certainly wants to challenge us. There's no doubt about that. But the Bible is very clear. We can't measure up and we don't have to measure up to be accepted by God. <laughs> God accepts us with all our imperfections. The Bible says, by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So if Jesus doesn't want our focus on ourselves, trying to measure up to the challenge of this parable, what should we be focused on as we read it? The verses I just read from Ephesians, by grace you have been saved, through faith, they, they, they help us to see that God's grace through faith in Jesus means we should be focusing on the one in whom we put our faith. We should be focused on the one who gives us grace to live the lessons of this parable. If we just focus on ourselves, we'll never come up with the goods. But if we focus on the one who gives us the grace to live what we learn, we have a much greater chance of living what we learn. Remember, Jesus wants us focused on him. Which brings my mind back to that wonderful invitation. The first word Jesus says in this parable, come. Come. The same Jesus, the same Jesus who invites us to come to him, has already come to us. He came to us to help us. He came to us to save us. 
And by leaving the glories of heaven to die for us, he personally identified with everyone mentioned in this parable. Because as Jesus died for us, he identified with us in all our pain, our suffering, our agony, our loneliness, our nakedness. In fact, it was just two days after he shared this parable that Jesus showed his love for us by dying on a cross. Only 48 hours later, after sharing these words. And there he allowed himself to become thirsty and naked and captive on behalf of those who are not only spiritually thirsty, naked, and captive, but who may also be physically so. He identified with every one of us in all our struggles. Author Timothy Keller has written, Jesus, who deserved acquittal and freedom, got condemnation. So that we who deserve condemnation for our sins can receive acquittal. This was the ultimate instance of God's identification with the poor. He not only became one of the actually poor and marginalized. He stood in the place of all those of us in spiritual poverty and bankruptcy and paid our debt. So as we look at this parable, I don't want you focused on yourself. I don't want you looking in the mirror and checking if you measure up. I want you to look at Jesus who came to save us and who came to help us to live the lessons of this parable. I want you to see Jesus who came near to us to die for us, to pay the penalty for all our rebellion against God so that we can be forgiven for that rebellion and have a, a relationship with God forever. And then he was raised from the dead by God. The, so that he can now help us to live this parable. So, a king who invites us in. Now, I don't want to get all, I don't want to mislead you. I don't want to get all touchy feely about the king who invites us in without talking about a king who demands integrity. It's clear that Jesus really does want us to live this parable because he says the sheep he invited to come to him are the people who were obedient to living the sacrificial love that, that he expressed to us. So he's calling people who lived according to his ways. So he truly wants us to live this parable. Jesus wants to, to, us to live our lives in a way that reflects his life. As we show his love to those he so powerfully identified with on the cross. And that's because Jesus is a king. Who he, and he wants us to follow him as Lord of our lives. He's not just somebody who says come. He's somebody who says follow. Follow me. I'll live the way I live. Right? And the people he invites to come to him are the people who have been following him. Did you know that for every instance that Jesus is called a savior in the Bible, there are 26 instances when he's called Lord. He's called Lord 26 more times than Savior. So he clearly wants us to make him Lord of our lives. Statements in Colossians echo this when Jesus is is mentioned in Colossians 2 verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. That means live like him, follow him, be like him. David mentioned we have a food bank. We, we've had that food bank running at the, our old Panet location where we used to be located. It started in 1992. That means it's 32 years in the running. A weekly food bank for 32 years. It's an example of giving people something to eat, just as Jesus mentions in this parable. Now, I volunteer at the food bank pretty regularly, and I tend to spend most of my time mingling with people. So I'll pop down at a table when, where some people are waiting their turn to pick up food, and I'll just start conversations with them. Many people know me by now, and people are, are most often very happy to chat as, as they wait. One day I was chatting with a group of people at a table, and an elderly lady was reminded of a joke as we were chatting. But she was worried that it might be a little bit too spicy for me. She knew 
my background a little bit. She knew I was, I, I was from, I went to church and I think she, I think she knew I was a pastor. So out of concern and in total seriousness, she asked me, are you a religious man? Now I know the typical Christian answer to that. The standard Christian answer is, no, 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 I'm not religious. I'm in a relationship. I'm in a relationship with Jesus. That's, that's a typical answer to a question like that. But can I be honest with you? I don't like the standard Christian answer. I don't like that answer. So, with enthusiasm, she asked me, are you a religious man? I said, yes, I am a religious man. And everybody in the crowd just kind of cringes and think, what's wrong with this guy? That's not the standard Christian answer. Well, she told the joke anyway. And actually, it wasn't too spicy at all. In fact, it was quite funny. But unfortunately, it was a little too spicy for a sermon. So I won't be sharing it this morning. But as a religious man, I want to ask you, especially those of you in this room who don't like the word religious, or don't like putting that label on yourself, do you know what the word religious means? These people who say, I'm not religious, do you even know what religious means? It boils down to this essential meaning. If you have a pen, I'm going to invite you to fill in the blank on your form, on your handout, if, if you want to, if you want to remember this definition. It boils down to this essential meaning. Expressing outwardly sacred values you believe inwardly. That's religious. Expressing outwardly sacred values you believe inwardly. In John Wesley's day, in the 1700s, John Wesley was an evangelist. Uh, and he was a radical evangelist. And in his day, he described people who repented and began living godly lives as religious. We would think the opposite today. We think of the word religious as a negative word. Let's get biblical here. Okay? Come on. For all you people who don't like the word religious, think about this. The only time that the word religious or religion is used negatively in the Bible is when a qualifying word is added to it when in the book of Colossians it talks about self-made religion. Self-made religion is not the kind of religion John Wesley was talking about. And it's not the kind of, kind of religion the Bible talks about. Because there's another verse in the Bible that talks about it, the, the word religion very, very positively. Because everywhere else in the Bible, aside from that instance in Colossians where it talks about self-made religion, everywhere else in the Bible, it's either used in a neutral way or a positive way. Listen to James 127. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep yourself unstained by this world. Did you catch that? God who inspired James 127 says that religion can be pure. Religious, religion can be undefiled. In other words, religion can be good. In God's eyes, pure and undefiled religion is a religion that looks after the marginalized and keeps yourself from practicing the sins of this world. That's what it means to express outwardly sacred values we believe inwardly. That's being religious. So when she asked me, are you a religious man? Yes, I am a religious man. And I hope you are a religious people. So when Jesus sits on his glorious throne to judge the nations, as he does in this parable, he's looking for religious people. He's looking for those whose outward actions reflect their inward convictions. In other words, he's looking for people of integrity. Right? Yep. Whose inside matches their outside and whose outside matches their inside. And as a follower of Jesus, for a follower of Jesus to be a person of integrity, it means calling Jesus Lord and doing what he says. 
Jesus once asked his listener, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not, not do what I tell you? Jesus expected obedience. And he expected people who called him Lord to do what he tells them. And so as we look at this parable today and consider doing what Jesus judges people for in this parable, we might wonder, and it would be fair to wonder, okay, exactly where and when, before, before Jesus mentioned this parable, exactly where and when did Jesus actually tell us to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, welcome strangers, clothe the naked, visit the sick, and visit those in prison? Because Jesus never provided a list like that before mentioning it in this parable. So how would those people have known that that's how they were supposed to live? What did he say? What Jesus did say, instead of giving a list like that, was he said, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And when Jesus was asked the question, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus answered by, by stating two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. And then he said, these, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, let's look back at the Law and the Prophets. We'll see laws there like not holding on to wages of a worker after the work has been done. We'll see laws like not reaping your fields right up to the edges, but leaving some behind for the poor. And we'll see laws like helping someone um, with an ox that's fallen into a ditch and they need help getting their ox out of the ditch. So does that, because God's concern is with cattle and Crops and copper coins? Is that, is that what God is concerned about? No, no. It would be more accurate to say that all those laws reflect God's love for people. The point is, God doesn't want us to limit our obedience to him to just following a limited list of commands. God gave us those lists in the Old Testament or the list in Matthew 25, 31 to 46 to simply posture us to love people, whatever the situation, as needs arise. If somebody said, I only have to do these things that are listed in the parable, or these things that are listed in the, in the, in the laws of Moses, but if any other situations come up, I'm off the hook. Well, they've missed the point. The point is, love others. Not just be explicit about following a list. If we say we're a follower of Jesus, this parable teaches that we're to show mercy the way Jesus did to be able to say that we're a follower of Jesus with integrity. So I've just said not to focus on yourself, but on Jesus who is inviting us in. And then I said, make sure your outward actions reflect your inward convictions. That's hard to do both. Because if you're trying to get your outward actions to reflect your inner convictions, it's, it's, you, you want to look at yourself. You want to examine yourself. But remember, the reason we want to look more to Jesus than to ourselves is because he's the only one who can help us to accomplish this. It is hard to do both. To keep our eyes on Jesus while also examining ourselves to make sure our lives reflect what, what we believe. And this is why it's so vital to see here that Jesus personally identifies so strongly with the, with the people we love. He said, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. In other words, as our actions reflect a love for people Jesus so closely associated himself with, we align our lives with his heart. And by doing so, we will become closer to him. We will become closer to Jesus as our lives become aligned with his heart. And his heart is identified in this parable. But there's an important reason why Jesus so closely identifies with the people he lists in this parable. There's a really important reason. And it has to do with who he has in mind as he tells this parable. Now I personally... And this, this may not be everybody's view, and I, I'm okay with that. But I personally don't believe that Jesus is talking about anyone in need when he calls us, when he calls those being helped his brothers. I don't think Jesus expected us 
to visit every single human in every single hospital, every single prisoner in every single prison, or to invite every single stranger we meet into our homes. I just don't believe that's what he had in mind. There's plenty of debate among scholars over who the least of these are. And it's easy to be too casual in how we come to a conclusion. Is Jesus talking about anyone in need? Anyone we meet? Anyone who comes across our path? Because we know that Jesus clearly has a heart for anyone in need. That's clear in scripture. Jesus cared about anyone in need without exception. That's who he came for, for the oppressed, for the poor, for the blind. He wants to help people in need. But we're not talking about all of scripture here. We're talking about this parable. And in the context of this parable, Jesus seems to be narrowing his focus by saying the least of these, my brothers. Did Jesus consider all the poor his brothers? If we were to say that Jesus considers everybody who's poor his brother, then we're imposing contemporary thinking onto Jesus 2,000 years ago. They didn't think that way then. There's nowhere in scripture that Jesus calls anyone his brother except someone who was a follower of Jesus. And yet he explicitly says brothers here. Earlier in this same account of Matthew, in fact, Here's a little hermeneutical lesson for you, a lesson for how to interpret the Bible. If you don't know what a word means, then check the context, the immediate context. If the immediate context doesn't make it clear what the meaning of that word is, then check the rest of the book written by the same author. Because the author tends to use the word uniformly. And if that doesn't help, then you look beyond that. But that's that's a good way to stay in context and when trying to find the meaning of a word and earlier in this account that in this account that Matthew wrote of Jesus's life Matthew included the following story while he was still speaking to the people behold his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him but he replied to the man who told him who is my mother and who are my brothers and stretching out his hand toward his disciples He said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And then elsewhere in the same book of Matthew, Jesus says, whoever gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water because he is a disciple. Remember, he just mentioned that in the previous passage I wrote. In other words, a brother. Truly, I say to you, he will by, by no means lose his reward. Disciple brother same meaning according to this passage and he considers a brother or a disciple those who do the will of his father in other words the sheep that we see in this parable this was the understanding of the early church as well because in in a book written to the to, to the early churches it was written So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. There's everyone. Everyone is included in in the heart of God. And especially to those who are of the household of faith. Our brothers, our sisters, our spiritual family. There's something really important here that I don't want us to miss. Something in Jesus' heart about blessing his followers. Or to put it more meaningfully, according to the language that Jesus used... Looking after his family. There's something really important in Jesus' heart about looking after his family. If we as a church can't do that, how will people who aren't in the church even take us seriously? And that's why Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my, my disciples if you love one another. Do do you get the point? He says, well, love one another three times. And in each case, he's talking about loving people within the family of God. Jesus wasn't afraid to narrow the focus and say, hey, this is important to me. Care for my family. It was just a few weeks ago that we took a love offering for somebody in this family. And I'm so proud of you. You stepped up. There's... There was someone in our midst who had a legitimate and genuine need that was way beyond the means of that family. 
and something that was essential that needed to be done, some, that, that a dental surgery that they couldn't afford. They needed about 75% of what our weekly offering is. And we're behind in our offerings this year. We're, we're well behind. And here we are thinking of taking a love offering so for somebody who needs 75% of what a weekly offering is. Well, we're preaching through the book of Acts. My goodness, we don't want to just treat this as knowledge in our heads and ignore the, 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 the idea of living what we learn. We want to not just be informed by the book of Acts. We want to be inspired by the book of Acts. And so we said, let's do what they did in the book of Acts. Where they, where they gave extravagantly to those in need within the church. And let's take up a love offering. And $1,700 out of $2,000. And the family was okay with that. The family wanted to contribute from their own pockets. And so that, that left $300 for them to contribute. And $1,700 came from you. And God bless you as you gave. Thank you. None of this means we're not meant to love the poor. Just because I'm focusing on Jesus' family here, I don't want to mislead you. None of this means we're not supposed to love our neighbor. Jesus covers that in, a, in other passages. That's all through the Bible. But in this parable, this specific parable, Jesus has a specific focus. What Jesus said in this parable was that when Jesus sits as king on his throne to judge the nations, he will be very concerned with how people treated his family. If you are a follower of Jesus, that speaks of how much Jesus loves you as his brother or as his sister. He loves you that much that he wouldn't want you to be left in need. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, it speaks of how much he wants to love you as a brother, as well as as a king. And as this, par this parable also tells us that he will recognize those he, who have truly made him their king by the sacrificial love that they express to the people in his family. That's how he'll recognize them. But remember, it's not our love for one another that makes us worthy, as if we're earning it, worthy to be one of his family are, are counted among his sheep. It's our love for Jesus' family that provides clear evidence. He has already made us a part of his family. And this parable shows us that Jesus wants our love for each other to be expressed in the here and now. As Jesus helps us to live like him in this world. We will only find those opportunities as we gather together as a family. If we live our lives independent of one another, we'll never have these opportunities. We wouldn't have had the opportunity for that love offering. We'll only find them as by being together as a family, together with all our needs, and together with all our flaws, and with Jesus' love at work in each of our hearts to care for each other. So let's look for the opportunities. Let's be on the lookout for ways we can help one another. You'll see them in each other's hardships. Really, that's the practical part of this message. You will see the opportunities to put this parable into practice in one another's hardships. Which, and Jesus listed so many of them here. But there are others that he didn't include. And there's a cost. There's a cost to getting involved in each other's hardships. And it's a cost that this parable compels us to consider. But it's a cost we'll be rewarded for by a king who loves us and who cares for us as a shepherd and who calls himself our brother. That's how we know we'll be rewarded because of how much he loves us as, his bro as our brother. So I'm going to invite Ed to come on back up. And we're going to end with worship. I want to end with our eyes on Jesus. Not looking in the mirror, seeing, am I measuring up to this parable? But on Jesus, who's the only one who can help us to live what we learn from this parable.